Nice yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, thanks so much for joining us for our fourth webinar. Um, just a little bit of background. I think most of you know how or why um, we started the Elders Council. Um, it's because um, Mel and Chris and I had dinner about three years ago and we're talking about um, all the issues to do with getting older, but also to do with uh, succession and transition from your organization. Um, some of us like, like Chris have, are serial social entrepreneurs and seem to do transition and succession with great ease and other, others of us like me seem to struggle and um, cause myself and everybody else great pain. So um, uh, we felt that despite the fact that sustainability is one of the biggest uh, issues in um, the social enterprise sector, and one of the biggest issues about sustainability is succession and transition, and yet nobody talks about it. And we felt that we needed a safe space um, that, that was created by social entrepreneurs for social entrepreneurs to create that safe space to have these discussions amongst ourselves. Um, we have to thank um, hugely um, Ashoka and, and uh, Clementine and Mika and Florian for all their support and great work for us and thank you to them and also of course to Pavitra at um, the um, World Economic Forum for supporting us at the Schwab Foundation so thank you to both of them. We've had uh, we've had four uh, webinars as I say one the first one was um, who are you if you're not your organization how do you feel about moving on um, should I stay or should I go and what uh, how do you how do you navigate prepare for or navigate uh, succession and transition and then when I'm 64 some of the practical issues around uh, getting ready for and both for your own personal feelings and for the health, health and well-being of your organization uh, about um, the practical issues of, of moving along we've had some um, we've had some great uh, meetings we we met with with a group of people, two at least who were in Aix with us in um, last year, and Kat, I know, is uh, here too, um, a, a, a more people who really thought this was a very important issue, and 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 some are thinking already of creating, developing this in their own countries. We've had some uh, really great speakers and there are some great quotes like, how do you replace the magic of the founder, especially around fundraising? And how do you make sure that you can announce you're going to be stepping down, but don't end up feeling like a lame duck? And uh, as one person said, they did. And then um, there are real dangers um, in, in, in stepping down. How do I feel? as a change maker if I'm doing something that doesn't mean enough to me. And so the, it's all about the succession of the organization of you and what do you need to get through that. And we want to provide that safe space for us all to be able to discuss it and really help each other along with it. And so we need a lot of your comments and guidance about how to do this um, for, the, for the best uh, possible outcome for the whole sector. So I'm handing over to you, Chris. Um, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, that's great. And um, uh, a, a quick and warm welcome to Samantha and Zainab who have come to join us on this particular call. We really appreciate the uh, support that you're giving us in the background, the registration of the organization and your, much, and your presence here today is much appreciated. Um, so uh, we have three speakers for today. The first speaker will be uh, Vera Cordero, then the second will be Sarah Corbett, and then the third, Nancy Mortefi. And so uh, I'll ask each speaker to introduce themselves briefly as they come on, and then uh, to give us their talk, um, which will be uh, 10 minutes each, and then we'll have lots of questions and, uh, and discussion. Uh, until Mel sums us up at the top of the hour. Que if you have questions, do please pop them into the chat and um, either Mel or, um, 
uh, or Andrea will pick up the questions and feed them back as we go along. So without further ado, Vera, you're most welcome. We've been looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, do please uh, give us your talk on uh, the magnificent dance. Thank you, over to you. So Chris, thank you all for this great opportunity to be with all of you here. Uh, is, is very, I'm very happy to share not a, a small part of my work, but to talk about my life, what, how I am living and how I'm living, let, letting the, the, the work go a little bit out of me, you know. So I, cre I am a physician and I create uh, Instituto Dara, Dara Institute three decades ago. As a physician working in a public hospital in Brazil, I understood that I have to go beyond the hospital walls to create something very different to really treat, especially the children, the children that I saw in the hospital. And I, and I suffer with them, you know, because uh, I realized that disease is just the tip of the iceberg. If you really want to treat the, the children and the poor family, we have to go to the real cause of the disease in developing countries, especially poverty. So we did that for three decades and we created the family action plan that really works very well. That I don't speak about this now, but um, after three decades, as I said, we, we transformed the life of around 75,000 people. We became public policy in the third largest city in Brazil, Belo Horizonte. And most of them, many social entrepreneurs, they learn with us and they implement our social methodology. Uh, they add some new things, but they implement the DNA of our social methodology in four continents for the benefit of 500,000 people. I don't know, more, more, a lot of people. They change the life of a lot of people. Just coming back to my routine and my family, I would like to share that I'm married for 45 years with Paulo, my husband. We have been separated for four years, but we remarried. And I have two wonderful daughters, Marina, that lives in London, near Andrea, and you, Chris. Uh, she has 42 years old. And I have Laura, who lives in Brasilia, and she worked for the British government. So I have some karma or dharma with the, the British empire. I don't know why, but that's something that I don't know. So I love my daughters. And one day I was fighting with God and I said, oh my God, you put my daughters very far from me. One living in London, the other one in Brasilia. So you want me to walk? I, I understood, but I have my own way to walk. I will change. If you really want or if you don't want, doesn't matter, I will change. So what I did, I, I separate the morning. I don't walk in the morning. Uh, I, I do meditation, I walk near the beach. I am supposed to work five times uh, per week, but I walk, to tell you the truth, three times per week. I take care of many things of my house. It's time for myself. I consult the Aishi during this period. Then uh, one p around 1 p.m., I start walking. And to tell you the truth, I don't imagine myself not working in the strategic issues of the organization, as well in some very creative new projects, you know, how to expand more all, all over the, the world, all over Brazil, because we already implement the methodology in Baltimore and near Washington, DC. But how can, uh, I, I don't see myself in the next five years leaving totally the work that I'm doing. Because to work for me is like to paint, you know, is like making a, a, you know, a painting, you know, is like uh, uh, make gardening, you know, working with children. It's something very, I, I feel very fulfilled in not working too much in the operation, operational area, but in strategic issues, it's like uh, a little girl who, who, uh, who joke with others, you know? Uh, and I, I think it's very good for me. Yeah. One thing that I didn't mention in my routine is that I love, for example, to, to watch Netflix with my husband till 1 
a.m. in the morning because it's the time that we can, you know, be together. And to tell you the truth, in this uh, pandemic time, I used to to read a lot, but I can't read anymore. I hope the vaccine will come very soon to come back to read because I can see films, you know, art in some sense save us, you know, for for this terrible time. So. I would like to speak about, about another aspect of my life. When I'm getting old, a lot of people around me, they are sick, and they die. And I mentioned that with Nancy, when I talked, she was my therapist. I have to say that and a wonderful therapist, she'll be forever. And I mentioned that issue, you know, because you know, life shows you that there is a limit for your body. <laughs> In, at least for your body, I believe in spiritual life. So, but you know, uh, that was, that is, a, is something that makes me very, very sad, you know. One thing is to die. The other thing is to see people dying for four years, 10 years, that's terrible. But I, I used to say, what is the opportunity behind that sadness? And I realized that the great opportunity is to improve my spirituality. I have one friend of mine, she gave me the I Ching when I was uh, thir uh, 30 years, uh, many times ago, so uh, 30 years ago. And I used to consult the I Ching very frequently uh, to, to understand who am I, you know, what are, you know, uh, the main things behind my behavior. Because I don't know if you are familiar with the I Ching, but the, the I Ching can be very hard with you because they show you, uh, you know, the intention behind your behavior. They show who you are. And as you know, it's not simple to change partners of your behavior. So, but I love the I Ching because it's like, a, you know, a light that shows your partner, show you your problems, your real problems. And you have the, the great opportunity to change. So I'm addicted to the Aishing, just to tell you. And Bhagavad Gita as well helped me a lot. But I, I have, you know, I have Sarah, the great opportunity. Sarah, you have about uh, two minutes left. So I have the great opportunity to, you know, to have a great team that we, we build together, a great team. I have a wonderful CEO, a wonderful director. I have my... A great assistant, Martha Gonçalves, that I love, and she helped me to, to leave the institution. I want to, to, to tell you that, you know, one thing that I love uh, to understand that what matter in life, what really matter, what really matter is deep, uh, deep, uh, deep relationship with familiar people and with friends. And that I want to spend more time with, you know, friends that I love the most and, you know, my husband, my daughters and so on. So I plan to have sabbatical times and so on. And I want to finish my, you know, my speech with something that Vinicius de Moraes is a poet, a Brazilian poet, Vinicius de Moraes, who said that life is the art of meeting, deep meeting although there is a lot of misunderstanding in that world that we all live. So thank you all. Thank you very much indeed. Really appreciate your talk. And, uh, and we will come back to the poet, I'm sure. Uh, it sounds um, like a fantastic epithet for life. So living well and leaving well, this is the magnificent dance. And so, uh, it's become our um, habit to invite uh, a person who is not automatically uh, as young as us um, to, uh, <laughs> to uh, also make a presentation and to speak to us about what's in their mind. So we really have great pleasure in welcoming you, Sarah. So welcome, Sarah Corbett. Do please give us your presentation. Thanks, Chris, and thanks everyone for having me. Um, I'm going to set my alarm so that if I'm over, I'll know because an alarm will go off. I'll um, keep an eye as well for so you. You can keep an eye as well, Chris. Yeah. Um, 
so as always, I have too much to say and 10 minutes to say it. So hopefully this is interesting and useful. I guess my journey is as a, an Ashoka Fellow, I run the Craftivist Collective, which is a social enterprise, people, groups and organizations around the world use my gentle protest methodology to craftivism, which is activism, use and handicrafts. It's all about slow, kind and strategic activism and using the process, the product and the public sphere to engage in social change. And it all happened by accident in lots of ways. Um, and in lots of ways, I've been quite reluctant to grow. And this year has been an opportunity, really. I travel so much with work, explaining what I do, doing workshops, consultancy, projects, collaborations. Um, and this year has given me time to say, why do I keep saying no to funding? Why do I keep saying no to scaling up? And actually, my thought now is that we live in such a world where old you know if anyone's read the book new power which if you haven't please do you know we don't live in old power anymore we're in new power with social media with the digital world we live in the way we communicate differently how influence is very different now with social media and with how business works in different ways that i don't think me scaling up the craftivist collective one is the most effective way to have impact. Um, and also it's not my skill set. I've never wanted to run an organization. I've managed staff before when I've worked for big NGOs. I'm not particularly good at it and I don't enjoy it. I'm an introvert. So some of you might have seen my TED talk, Activism Needs Introverts. And I'm much better at doing tinkering and doing objects and projects on my own where I can see there's a gap and there's a need and putting them out there as case studies, as projects, as kits, as case as um, experiences for people to take part in, but also for people to just take and use in whatever they want in their own context. And that doesn't need an organization to do it. And I think the world we live in now, you know, we've seen this year, you can't plan what the future holds. You know, everything's changing so quickly with technology, with global warming, you know, often speeding up the way that we're having to change things that I think the best way I can be of use is as a one woman band so not scaling up um, and I do everything in my little flat which actually is really sustainable for me it limits how much I can do which in some ways I sort of grieve a little bit that I want to take over the world some days and then I think well actually I don't want staff I don't want an office I want to be as agile as possible I want to be able to say okay I'll help you with that project where no one knows I'm helping because it's not about me or a public um showing of what we do but I can have most impact there or I'm gonna do a project and try and get funding just for that project because I see a real need for example with COP26 next year or with working with certain audiences that activists um, find it hard to attract. So I think in the context of where I see new power and my power with gentle protest and, and craftivism is all about soft power rather than hard power. A lot of it's indirect influence. Some people don't realize that we're influencing them, which is part of the plan sometimes in a non-manipulative ethical way. Um, sometimes it's much more about getting hundreds or thousands of people involved in something. But what I've learned over the years um, doing this quite organically um, and create in this global community of people who want to do protest in a gentle loving and more effective more ethical more actually healthy and personally sustainably for people and use craft as one form to do it but other forms to do it what's been really humbling over the year is seeing where I'm having most impact and a lot of it is indirect where I can't claim it as my own and I wouldn't where some people have taken different ingredients of what I do and used it in stuff that might not involve craft or might be about changing an organization from within, or it might be about seeing activism in a different light or working with people of a different political ideology to them that they'd never thought of, but they've seen me do it. And then they say, I'm gonna take a bit of that. And I think that's um, really important actually in the world we live now that most of you know how hard it is to measure social change and measure systemic change and behavioral change and change in hearts and minds and laws and policies and 
I worry, I think what stopped me from growing is one, I don't want to become, even if it's a small size, I don't want to become a size where I just have to apply for funding to stay afloat for me and my team. I never want to get to that point where it's just doing something for the sake of staying, not going in the red. Um, I always want to do really high quality work. I want to do less things, but better. Um, and that is often hard when you're applying for funding. So I have people who adopt me for £10 a month or £120 a year for me to use their money in whatever way I think is most useful for the community, which is incredible. Um, so I think that's a helpful model. Um, and yeah, if we're, you know, coming to the, the let and go, I think actually if I can, my goal is always create and catalysts for positive change in a humble, healthy and high quality way. And sometimes that's directly, I can see A to B and deliver it. So like winning a campaign where m and pay the living wage to, to um, 10,000 staff or 20,000 staff, it was about, we wanted them to pay the living wage and we won that campaign. But a lot of the impact I have, I have no control over. And I think in the world we live in now, that's a, a good thing. We want people to take ownership of seeing a model out there that they could use, of seeing a new way of doing things that they can implement into their own context. And that's why I think actually I want to be able to do some stuff with charities, with brands that don't normally do things some stuff on my own um but really the next few years is quite exciting because for me it's like there'll be some stuff I won't be able to do and I'm letting them go and some ways I have to have a little tear for them and then leave them um but other stuff I'm like actually I want the Craftivist Collective website I want everything to be free and available I'm going to put all my instructions free up there as lovely pdfs people can download I want videos to say here's how you do your own workshop that are free people can still buy my kits and tools and services as an add-on but they don't need me so I want to create the craftivist collective as something that could actually end up having more impact by bringing in no income and I can go and do a gentle protest book and non-craftivism stuff Oh, yeah, you've got about two minutes yeah or I could go and do that for two years knowing that there's stuff for the craftivist community to still do without me having to be there and I could come back so it's not about I'm going to leave the collective it's about how can I create an online resource that doesn't need me but I can top up stuff and I'm still there for people and social media is an interesting one because people want to know the person behind it so they know it's me so how do I one of my challenges is how do I carry on the collective um, as, a, as a support system for them not to feel like I'm leaving them, but where it's healthy for me to go off and do a gentle protest book or go off and do something for a few months and come back. Um, and I think that's fine. Like, I don't think we need to go through the standard way that we've had a model. So my goal is to keep creating catalysts in whatever way that is in this crazy world we live where we can't plan lots, do a lovely handbook this next year, do a no lovely new website, um, create lots for free, keep my people who adopt a craftivist, my patrons, which I think is a good model and a flexible model um, and not do stuff for the sake of scaling, for the sake of status issues of you know you're only successful if you've got a team behind you for a long you know for the last couple of years as an Ashoka fellow I have to be honest and say I felt quite embarrassed that I hadn't scaled up I became an Ashoka fellow a couple of years ago um, and there was definitely a push of your thing has got potential to let's get you as a social enterprise or as a charity let's get you staff and there was always something stopping me do that and I think as a, a vicar's daughter and a politician's daughter, they're so amazing. They're both amazing at working with people, grassroots, on the front line. I have never been good at that. I'm an introvert and I love tinkering on my own. So seeing people who are incredible at that, knowing that that drains me of energy rather than gains me of energy, actually has been really helpful for me to be a bit selfish and look at self-care and look at sustainability and see where can I have the best, um, you know, where can I be of service in the world, but in a way that doesn't burn me out, which I think all of us are trying to straddle that balance. Um, so I'm going to stay as a one woman band and try and do these catalysts in whatever way 
that is sustainable for me and is of service to the world. Thank so, you. You I arrived on the on. bell. There we go. You arrived on the bell. There we are. That's very good. Uh, many, many thanks indeed for your presentation. I hope it made sense. I think I just rambled out loud, but... <laughs> well, no, I think the whole, the, the subject is living well and leaving well, and you're, and you're indicating how you intend to live well uh, and uh, how you intend to, to uh, manage your life in that particular way, which is absolutely brilliant. So it definitely contributes to the conversation, just as we hoped it would. You. So thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Sarah. Really appreciate it. Um, and, um, and for someone who is very shy and all the rest of it, um, I must say, I thought you did pretty well. <laughs> Uh, uh, so uh, many thanks and we now turn to you Nancy uh, for the last presentation of the day you're really welcome you were there right at the beginning when we were planning uh, the elders council and uh, you had you were part of the first conversations then you had to duck out and uh, and uh, follow a different path for a while but so we're it's lovely to have you back as it were uh, and to the fourth and last of the year uh, webinars that we're having here. Just before you speak, I noticed that Kat was already kissing a man in the um, in the uh, uh, presentation, but I, I don't know whether that is official or unofficial, but we'll leave it there. Um, uh, so uh, Nancy, do please uh, come in and uh, give us your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And thank you to Andrea and Mel as well for inviting me to be part of this. Even though I took a different path, you've been in my heart and continue to be so every time I get a lovely email from Clementine, it's a reminder of how connected I feel with all of you. Some of you I know and some of you I don't. I love your energy, Sarah. It's wonderful to hear young, youngsters, we'll call them youngsters, coming up um, behind us uh, and beside us and, and moving through into the next uh, round you know because we're we we elders are in the front line and we will be making space for the youngsters to come up after us mm. that's a wonderful thing um as the dean of the inner works programs for the uh well-being project i have a, a wonderful opportunity to have an intimate relationship with hundreds of really of um social change makers and uh, it's a real gift. And I, I'm continuously in awe about how they live and leave and then live again well. And I think for myself and the transitions that I've made over the years, uh, and most recently a, a major one again, is that uh, taking time to be quiet has been a really important part of that. So I'm going to take up uh, the invitation to lead a meditation today, just a quiet time where we can all at this time of year when it's so busy, just sort of have a moment for ourselves. And I'll be guiding it along, it'll be 10 minutes as you know, and uh, just invite you to gaze softly down or close your eyes, whatever feels right for you. And, uh, and just come along for a little, little ride, a little journey. So as we do this, I welcome my breath. See if you can bring in some awareness of your breathing without any efforting. We don't have to do anything special. We're very e equipped to breathe well. Just be noticing the inhalation that's coming in through your face and behind your eyes. We might notice some thoughts, busy mind, memories, considerations about what you're hearing, preferences. All of this is what's going on in our heads all the time. As we inhale, we can just let some of that dissipate. And with the next inhale, let's let it trickle down into our throat so we feel where our throat is. Focus our attention to our throat and the sensation of the throat with breath coming in and out. And when we do this, we're not changing anything. We're just meeting what is. 
So if you feel a tightness there, that's okay. If you feel an urge to speak, that's okay. And then letting the air again trickle down deeper into our chest. So with our next inhale, filling the chest with life-giving breath. Focusing our attention to that rising and falling of our chest. You might find as you're focusing on the sensation of your chest, there's a little less going on inside the mind. We're moving more into the body. And then on our next inhale, let the air trickle down to our solar plexus, the space <clears throat> for diaphragm it rises and falls. Many of us carry tension there. We're not going to worry about changing anything. Just notice what it feels like and let the air come in and out. And then down into the final place of our destination in the belly. So feeling the, the breath come in and out the belly. It's deep inside. And for me, that is the place where I feel at home. Home in my own body, home in my sacred domain. Notice how it feels to be in this place where you're alone, not lonely, but alone in this place of home. And if you will, you can imagine yourself standing in front of a reflecting pool of still water. And the stillness of the water is echoing the peace within you. And the breath comes in and the breath goes out. And we settle more deeply into this place of home. Now, if you'd like to, you can stay there. You're welcome to stay here alone in the quietness of your home base, if you will, or you can continue to follow me into another experience. <clears throat> if you are, I invite you to bring someone into your space, someone who, who brings a sensation of safety into your life. It could be a parent, a dear friend, a faith leader, a special teacher, living or past, whose presence evokes a feeling of compassion, of belonging and caring. And beside you, and close enough so that you can feel the warmth of their presence supporting you in this moment. Now, in the safety of the special caring relationship, we want to bring our awareness to our ancestral lineage. They're all here with us. Our parents, grandparents, great grandparents, and on and on and on. We are the offspring of a long line of survivors. Regardless of the relationship that you had or did not have with any of these people, Perhaps some of you may not even know who they are. We can still have gratitude because they lived, we are here. So invite them to join us and they are holding our back. They are behind us, they may have their arms 
hands touching our body, gently supporting us as we go in our, through our lives. In the presence of this ancestral lineage and caring companion, we are supported to take our place at the front of the line. Those of us who are in those elder years can own our own true gifts as an elder with strength and grace. And with that knowing, we turn our gaze into the reflective pool once again. And in that stillness, we can see the faces of the important young people in our lives. Those who, who look to us for compassionate support and caring. Whose faces do you see? Perhaps are the faces of your own children, nieces or nephews, or young people that we serve through our work. And yes, the faces of the children yet to come. How will we show up for them? So now, to the sound of my Christmas bells, you can return to this room and take a quick look around at all the faces, the names that you may or may not recognize, but are all on this journey with us. We can feel gratitude that we're not alone on the journey of the eldership and there are some wonderful, marvelous young people who are coming up behind us and with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you very much indeed. Welcome. That was a beautiful meditation uh, on the theme of living well and leaving well, the magnificent dance. Thank you very much indeed. So ladies and gentlemen, we uh, pass very smoothly now from uh, this part of the uh, meeting with Vera and uh, Sarah and uh, Nancy in great gratitude. And then now we come to a time when some of you may like to speak. And uh, if you have a question or a, or a thought, just something you'd like to share, uh, you're very welcome to come in Give me an indication either by just uh, giving me a call or by putting the question on the chat. Because we have uh, more than one screen's worth of people, I can't automatically see you waving. So it will be necessary for you just to give me a quick hello and uh, I can um, easily bring you in or we can bring you in by looking at the questions. Andrea, Andrea can you see anyone with a question there? You're on mute at the moment, Andrea. Sorry about that. Hmm. Well, I can't see a question at the moment. And I just wonder if um, there's anyone uh, here who, who would like to talk about any of the issues that have come up for them hmm. in, uh, in recent times. What sort of top of people's minds about moving on or what they're experiencing at the moment. One of the great benefits of this particular group is that we are quite happy to work with silence. So, um, so there's no need to jump or to feel you have to rush. Um, so uh, Sarah, you have put a point there. Is that you, is that from you, Sarah? Yeah, come on in. I don't know if I, am I allowed to ask a question? Is this on brief? Yes, and there you are. Yes, yes. 
um, some of the best questions come from the people who have spoken. Yeah, I guess. Um, I mean, I've asked a few people in other contexts who've scaled up and very successful and, you know, had a few years doing this or um, are as accomplished as you guys, where I've asked them very quietly, you know, do you, are you glad you scaled up? Would you have done it differently? And I find it quite fascinating how some people are really honest and say, I wish I'd stayed as five people or I wish I'd done this and I passed it on earlier because I shouldn't have held on to it. Or, um, and obviously we're in a different context now, but I find it interesting to know if you do any of it differently. Um, yeah, if I'm allowed to ask. Yeah, you just have. Yeah. That's good, yeah, that's good. Thank you for that. Um, and if there's anyone who would like to come in, Kurt, you had a point of view on that, I think. Um, I appreciated what Sarah said. In discussions in, with experts in the field of international development, which always makes me feel a bit insecure, right? <laughs> um, one of the things that keeps coming up is that if we want to be resilient, and we're going to have to be resilient, no need to talk about COVID or money or anything, we're going to be resilient, then we need to be as decentralized as possible. Another way to put that is to be as close to the people that we said we existed for. Proximity and closeness and able to, um, to leg off on Nancy's uh, approach this morning. Can we hear them breathing? You know, even before they speak. Um, the whole idea of scale, of course, is to, to get bigger, expansive, and then we have to find surrogates for impact. And very often it's money or numbers. Um, so I, I think uh, if we choose to stay, to become more and more resilient, it does become harder to do in a world that rewards big and rewards power and looks at problems as if you have mammoth problems, you need mammoth budgets and mammoth organizations. That is a faulty presupposition. Oh. Um, building the case for the opposite is going to take probably another generation, oh. assuming that a generation is 15 years, where people no longer buy this story and no longer believe that you must get bigger to solve big problems. I think you have to get closer to the people and then outreach becomes not so much scale as scope. How many different people are, can do what we do so that you, you multiply rather than just get larger? Just some thoughts. Thank you very much, Kurt. That's great. Thank you for the question, Sarah. We're looking forward to you um, working on that along with other young people and uh, letting us know how it works. Um, it's a good one. Who would else like uh, to come in? Shona, come in. Yeah, I'd really like to agree with you, Kurt, there, and that I think the, the whole movement towards mega shopping centers and mega restaurants and mega everything um, has been really slow to take up in the social space. Um, where, where food has gone slow, where shopping has gone you know, to private, where everything's going back to caring about what you're doing and thinking about what you're doing, conscious, conscious action. And um, I really believe that we are being pushed by an external force to shift our organizations into a space that is not necessarily the answer at all. Mm. So and I fully see, agree with you. And I see this in, um, in my mentoring, you know, when people come to me. Kat, do come in. Uh, Kat, do you, would you like to just unmute? Yeah, yeah thank you. But thank there you so much. I think the concept of, of who defines what power is, is something that, um, like there are parallel, parallel ways of thinking in our societies. And if we, and part of the confusion for me 
um, as a person, an activist in my own community, was thinking that I had to choose between what the power structure said I should be doing. But the concept of the Underground Railroad is really what I think has kept the light for people like Sarah, who had an idea of what they should be doing and how important that the scale of one is in terms of scaling up. And it's just not part of our institution of education in terms of teaching that. It's not part of our corporate structure in terms of understanding that. And But I think the real power are the people who see the light and go toward the light irregardless of what the power structure says are the alternatives. So I really applaud you. Um, and no, you're not a baby because I saw you notice that you said, don't call me a baby. I'm 37 whole years old and we're not laughing at you. <laughs> But I am so inspired and encouraged that you're a light keeper and don't let anyone take that away from you because you're not on track. Yeah, that's great. If Yoma, welcome from Nigeria or welcome to you in Nigeria. Did you have a question or a point to make? I want to uh, contribute um, to the question, yes. which I hope I understood it. Mm -hmm. Um, more or less, I thought that what is Smith that uh, we might have from uh, the work we did. You know, I approached my work from a, a point of passion, a mm. lot of passion, mm. and I just went on implementation actions, activities, and I really didn't have any records. I didn't put systems for record. In, um, in such a way that um, they are retrievable, they are, you know, evidence, you'll be able to provide evidence-based records to show um, the milestones you've been able to record along the way. So I just concentrated on just, you know, following my heart. <laughs> And somebody said, you know, was introducing me to some other person and said, oh, hey, come and meet this lady that's just full of passion and no business plan, you know, to uh, what she's doing. And uh, that, of, of course, affected my ability to get uh, uh, funding. And so I practically funded my initiatives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ifiyama. Um, one of the things I just wonder, just to, to direct here at, at Vera, when you create um, in social enterprise um, a real institutional and infrastructure systems change, as you have done, it's very difficult to, um, to, to, to knowing that that could change children's lives all around the world and families' lives all around the world. Yeah. Do you feel then, Vera, that it's essential to, to, gr to grow um, in order to get that scale because it's important and, and can be replicated all around the world? Or do you feel it's, it's something that um, once, you, once you've created something that you just contain it and not scale it? Dear and oh, Andrea, what a wonderful question. We are at that moment discussing this inside the institution because you know the concept we created, uh, I don't know, 30 years ago is you know, uh, client center. You know, the client will say what they want to do, how they want to transform. And people used to blame that. Oh, you have to focus on education, health issue, blah, blah, blah. And we stay focusing many years because as poverty is a multidimensional problem, we have to have a multidisciplinary way to deal with poverty. But, uh, but going to the, your question, now we are under, in the beginning, Andrea, we start to have 23 organizations near 23 public hospitals in Brazil. But then we realize that's not a good idea. We learn a lot, but that's not a good idea. What we have to share is our knowledge. Share what happened with our, what we saw 
happening with our family that we have the privilege to serve. So we are now understanding, we already spread this kind of methodology in four continents with the help of some social entrepreneur, if deny or not is another uh, issue, but we already spread. Uh, but we, we want, you know, uh, Brazil is such a, uh, there is a lot of inequality. So how can we ask spread uh, end poverty or be a bad, better country? So we have to do something. And we are now understanding how to deal with the, the, the government of Brazil, federal government, not our, our um, president, thanks God, no, technical people, technical people. Uh, we are now understanding how they can understand the knowledge behind our work and spread it. Because finally it was clear without the government, we cannot spread in a country like Brazil. Thank you, Vera, very much for that. And thank you, Andrea. Uh, Heike, you had a point to make, and then after you have spoken, we'll invite Mel to uh, begin the uh, summary. I see, Ingrid, you want to make a comment. We'll see. We'll try to get you in, okay? Heike, please come in. Yeah. Thank you. I, I will be quick. Uh, what Sarah said resonated very much with me. Hmm. Um, I'm, I'm a Shoko Fellow from Germany for over um, almost 20 years now, one of the first ones in Germany. And the only one ahead of my group was Andreas Heineken, you might know with Dialogue in the Dark, who's helping blind people. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, and, and he, he was the first one um, and he was expanding like crazy. Every week uh, I felt he was in a different country and he had opened another museum somewhere. And we were, when we started, um, I had the feeling that Ashoka wanted to push us to grow, but we are doing science teaching for little kids and we were focusing so much more on, on quality than on, on growing. And so what Sarah said is, is resonating so much with me right now. And the other thing we wanted to do from the very beginning, that was when I started it back in 2002, I said, um, I wanted to do myself, wanted to make myself obsolete. I wanted to do, uh, to have this quality in the mainstream education so we don't need, they don't need us anymore. I mean, it's 20 years later, we're still here and I'm afraid um, in my lifetime, I won't be able to make myself obsolete uh, in, in, in this, in the field I'm in. Um, that's the one thing, but I'm working towards that. And the other thing is, um, the people uh, going out of my organization um, seems to be harder for the people in my organization than, than for myself. It's like um, somebody touched on fundraising and things I do a lot in, in my organization and, and stepping away from it, I, can't, I don't seem to find anybody to yet to, to take over. And that's that my, I mean, I, this, is still, this is still where I'm working. I'm only, I'm about 20 years older than, than Sarah, so, so I still have some time, but um, I'm kind of somewhere in the middle, you know, and I'm thinking about it, how do I do it? And that's why I love this, this organization. What we're doing here is great for me. Thank you. Thank you, Heike. Thank you. Well, people stepping away from their organization, that's often the problem. Who's going to do the fundraising? It's a common problem that comes up. Ingrid and then my, Megan, and then we'll go to Mel. Thank you. Yes. Okay, I try to be uh, briefly. I'm Ingrid. I'm an Ashoka Fellow for eight years already, and uh, I'm a psychotherapist in Flanders, uh, in Belgium. And um, yeah, I I liked what uh, what um, our first speaker Vera said uh, with the, the nice poem. I, I want to to say or the. the the sentence life is the, is the art of deep meeting. And um, I think by getting older, I'm 65 now, I'm still working very hard in, in, the, in my organization, social entrepreneurship with uh, giving therapy to youngsters uh, for free. Um, 
and we have much, much uh, too much uh, work to do with that in Flanders, and I think uh, in a big part of the of the world. But um, I think by by getting older, um, you really find this art. Uh, you really can feel the art of deep meeting, and uh, that that's that. That's the this is the the thing that we have to obtain in life. And uh, I think that confidence and the, also the knowledge we have when we get older that we can make a, a, a very positive part for the young people eh? and i will uh, i also uh, heard the, the word quality but i also think confidence is very important and, and knowledge what we give true to the youngsters and also in my organization we are more now more with than 600 persons all volunteers in giving this therapy to youngsters in flanders and uh, I see. I will. I will. Uh, I think I will. Um, I will work till I die. But uh, but of course, uh, I give also a lot of work to 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 other people. And the last thing I wanted to add is my my mother died two two months ago, and uh, I was really very sad, um, and still I am. But yeah, it's very special that I get some extra 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 strength now to to work and to go on to go on so uh, also what nancy did with the meditation the, the very warm thing she said uh, it was uh, it was really great it was the first thing the time that i can join but uh, i uh, i thank the, the three speakers and i thank you also for leading us that's all i want to say today ingrid thank you and um uh, very sincere condolences for your loss and um and thank you very much for joining us uh, we really appreciate that Megan, do come in. Sure, I know we're at time, but um, just to pick back up on that scale conversation, sometimes we don't choose scale, scale chooses us. And, and we have to be strong enough somehow to find our way through growth in a way that we are able to maintain our objectivity and evaluate, are we still able to have the impact day in and day out that really sits at our core and and that has our passion behind. You you're muted, Megan. I think it's a little bit an exercise in just fearless learning through that tension between growth, scale, um, the quality of the work we do, and and scale is not always bad. I think it's often in points where um, I, one of my favorite quotes is that growth demands a temporary loss of security. I think sometimes we, we are afraid of growth or maybe not afraid, but reticent to grow because we are um, at that point where we know we will have to let go of many things from our fingers to the hands of others. And that can be both incredibly exciting, but also really daunting and, uh, so it is, it is a real challenge all the time, this mm -hmm. conversation and tension between uh, growth, scale, and keeping things intimate in the way we are most comfortable with. I think all of us as human beings in this sector, we have that deep connection to the work we do that makes us want to be really close and hands-on and more intimate, while at the same time we have that other part that has this unbelievable desire to solve for and address and meet the need that feels so much bigger than we are. So those things always have to be in balance somehow. Thank you so much, Megan. And just to draw people's attention to the chat, there's um, a very interesting and useful commentary from Liam then, uh, with also a reference to uh, the website togetherall.com. Thank you for that, Liam. Um, now, Mel. Let's come to you to, our, uh, to close off the uh, session for today. And many thanks indeed once again to Vera, Sarah, and of course, Nancy. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, we're slightly, slightly over time, but uh, just bear with me for a couple of minutes. Um, the challenge is to try to sum all of this up. Um, but we, we had three great speakers um, coming in from uh, different angles onto this kind of lovely, magnificent dance that we've just had for the past, uh, the past hour. Vera, at one stage in Brazil um, of, of her life, describing what her life is like now, having moved her organization on. Um, I love the line of, um, 
uh, when she said work is like is like painting it's just very much part of life that, that that's what you do it's not it's it's not an imposition spending the morning not working and then the in, in the afternoon uh, uh, working and then watching Netflix in the in, in the evening so getting that work-life balance sorted out once you've uh, uh, established an organization and then leaving the organization with some some, some good people so some fa fascinating insights there uh, from 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 Vera then, 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 then we had Sarah from a from a different perspective altogether um, and something I guess people like of, of my generation really never thought of um, for us, it was always about setting up the, the clunky organizations, growing the organizations, and then moving on and potentially setting up another one. Whereas Sarah was talking about something that was much more fluid, um, talking about how you can influence as, as an individual, the, the power of soft power, if you like, um, indirect um, uh, action, which created waves, if you like, uh, around, which was very, very important. So it wasn't a question of of, of, of leaving ever a discussion of living well, getting that balance right between your life, your inner and your outer. And then um, Nancy was, was, was coming again, was asking us to take a time to reflect on ourselves, which is, which is something, um, of course, a lot of the social entrepreneurs will talk about, particularly when they come to the end of their career, that they never actually bothered about looking after themselves. They kind of end up in the space, oh, oh my goodness, it's quite a good organization, but uh, uh, what, what, what about me? What about my, my position? So I'm having a little time, taking time out just to reflect on ourselves um, and those of us around us. And I saw a couple of uh, comments in the chat about us being a group, a family. Um, and, and just remembering that, where, where, where we're from and getting that, that balance right is, is, is absolutely key. So three great spe speeches, talks to us uh, uh, under this heading, which I think were, 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 were great insights for us. Um, th then the next stage, we kind of um, moved on to the whole issue of scale. Um, is big a good thing, small a, uh, 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 um, a good thing? What, ab what about growth? Um, uh, somebody mentioned, where are we in, in, in the pandemic now? We have to look at things differently, more local. I, I think this is going to be a, a, a subject which is going to be ongoing in, in, in our, our discussions. It connects in with the leading well and living well, but how big do we want to be? Are we kind of saying as social entrepreneurs, as well, globalization, we're not interested, doesn't exist, when in point of fact it does, so how do we deal with that? Then you saw in the chat a comment there from Liam when he was saying, well, you can be your, yourself individually, but use global technology to, to, to create the family. Maybe there's an answer in there. But I suspect what will happen is uh, uh, in, in, in the coming weeks or so, this will be a topic for our discussion um, on, on uh, one of these webinars, the issue of growth and scale and size. And indeed, where um, organizations like Ashoka, who've done great support for us, uh, are pushing us, maybe they're pushing us in, in, in the wrong direction into places we don't want to go. So um, I hope I'll be able in just two minutes there to, to capture some of the uh, discussions that, that, that we've had. I just would like to finish by saying where we are as an organization. So we've had this first year, we've done four webinars, as, as Andrea said, we've had some great uh, speak, speakers, we've had some workshops which are a bit more intimate. Um, and towards the end of the year, we're going to go into reflection and then we will be planning next year's um, uh, uh, webinar sessions and meetings and possibly even uh, 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 meeting together if, if, if uh, COVID restrictions are ever uh, uh, lifted and talking about how um, this might spread in different uh, parts of the world. So we're going to be planning to do that in the next uh, week or so and then we'll come back to you to let you know uh, what, what the plan is. Uh, at the end of the year, the beginning of the year. But in the meantime, we'd be really, really grateful for your, your ideas. If you could think of a topic that you want to discuss, if you think uh, know a speaker who could particularly add value to what we have, um, we'd be really, really grateful to, 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 to hear from you. Any ideas, however wild they might be, we, we, we will have a look at. And as you can see from our past titles, we're good at coming up with um, uh, musical connections as well. So any themes around music or bands from the past or, or, or just now, very welcome or any other ideas. 
So we want to keep these sessions uh, intimate, um, together, family. We want to be in a position where we can genuinely share our, our inner feelings. That's how we support one another, how we learn. And I'll just uh, finish there uh, and, and say, once again, thank you very, very much to our speakers. Thank you very, very much to Ashoka, Schwab and others who've, who've supported us, some individuals uh, on the call also who've made all of this possible. And thanks very, very much to you for your uh, questions and insights and comments on, on the chat. Thank you all. And uh, please, please stay in touch. Um, let us know how you're doing and uh, we'll be back in touch with you for, you for sure. Thank you very much. Happy holidays. Thank you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.